So, the very last talk. Why are you continuing to say this again and again? Huh? Why are you saying this again and again? I don't know, just to... It's like, guys, soon you, you will be able to go home. No, I see a lot, of, a lot of tired people, but they they interested as well, so... All right. Let's well, go. I guess let's, let's switch the screen. Yep. <laughs> May we have uh, slides, please? Wonderful. Welcome. Great. Hey! So, hello everyone. This is a the great uh, conference, a great place to be. And uh, my name is Ilya Birman. I'm mostly known as a designer. I design things like transport maps and user interfaces of all sorts. And I work for a company which is called Brog Orbanov, where we also design a lot of very different stuff and we study design. I also DJ and play music and write music, of which I will talk a little bit later. And I've also developed a blogging engine, EGEA, which some of you may know or even use. And I have also created three JavaScript libraries that I will cover in a little bit more detail in the second part of this talk. And so it's called Designing Declarative APIs. And it's sort of about the design of your code, of the way your code is structured and presented to your user, which is the developer. So we'll start with some uh, things that I would call theory, and then we'll go to practice where I will show you some examples from my products that use uh, these ideas. So we use uh, JavaScript to extend HTML in all sorts of different ways. We uh, create our custom controls, like um, maybe some date pickers, or we could implement whole behaviors, like the ability to drag and drop uh, items of a list. And so let's, uh, let's say you're an author of one of such libraries, which is called Supercomplete, and it implements uh, some kind of text completion for a input field. So, for the developer to use your library, they would need to link your JavaScript file to their page, link, to your, uh, link your CSS file if you have one, and then for a particular element in their DOM to, to get the special abilities of this text completion, they would need to initialize uh, using some code like this, or maybe like this if you are using jQuery. And what I would suggest doing instead is using code like this. So just using a class and then initialize your library on all elements that have this class automatically. So instead of using imperative style where just to write a line by line what should be done, you use declarative style where you describe what the elements are or describe what their properties are and just let the script do the work to, to make the elements have these abilities or properties. So this idea is obviously not new. I, I'm sure many of you have heard it, about it or maybe used some uh, libraries that are built using this approach. I personally have learned it from Brilliant Photorama, which is a image gallery for the web by Artem Polikarpov. So it's a beautiful thing. It's, uh, it lets you show many pictures in a gallery like you see on the screen with uh, thumbnails and beautiful flick animations and support for all kinds of input devices and everything. And so if you have a bunch of images and you want to build a photorama uh, out of them, uh, all you have to do is to mark them up as an HTML file and then wrap them into a div with class equals photorama. And that's all you have to do. Photorama will take care of the rest. It will just work. And this is great. So I encourage you all to try this if you haven't yet. I think it's, it's the best. Uh, so when I try to convince some people to use this with their libraries, I often hear that there is something wrong with this approach. And I have a whole array of objections. And I would like to uh, go through some of them. So some people say that just linking a script shouldn't cause anything to happen on a page. So the idea is that if you just put this script tag in the beginning or in the end of the document. It, it shouldn't change anything. And I see where they come from, but that's not how everything works, right? For example, if you have a div with some class 
and then you link a CSS file to this document, this will immediately change the appearance of this div if this class is defined in this uh, CSS file. You don't have to write some crazy code like this. This is made up, right? But this could, uh, could have some meaning. That's not what we have to do. It just works. So automatic initialization is a good thing. That's, that's what we want. And it's as appropriate for JavaScript as it is for CSS. Other people would say this may cause conflicts. And they would say, what if I already have some element that uses this class name in my uh, project and it's hard to change it, uh, to change it all over uh, the project, and I don't want some script to just redefine the behavior based on class? Well, I don't see how this is a problem related to this topic because uh, you can also use this uh, constructor name somewhere in your code, or you can use this class, and the CSS which comes with your library can override it. So there are many techniques that we know and use uh, to deal with conflicts. So it's just a separate topic, and of course, it has to be uh, thought about. OK, so some people would say this will not work in single page applications. And typically, they would cite frameworks like Angular and React that were mentioned uh, today several times already. And that's true. But um, just out of curiosity, I went to some website to check the stats. And I found that one in about 2,000 to 10,000 websites use Angular. And React is used on like five times less websites. So these are very, very special cases. This is not uh, the standard way of you know, building uh, most of the pages. It's, it's a very different world. And so uh, I, I guess compatibility with, with most of the web is something you should start with. And then if for your library, for, for, for your functionality, it makes sense to be uh, used within the uh, frameworks of React or Angular, then you can just add uh, the support of it. So uh, supporting single page applications is just a feature, one of the features you, which you may or may not have, depending on how you envision your library in use. So these were some practical concerns. And some people would come up with this, which is more of uh, an ideological one. They would say HTML is for markup, CSS is for appearances, uh, JavaScript is for behavior, so let's, let's not mix them up. They think that if we put class in an element and it invokes some JavaScript code, this is somehow wrong. Well, that's not how the real world uh, works, actually. Uh, imagine you have a send button on your page and you wanted to send some kind of form. So what you could do to, to make it send this form is to write a code like this. So I'm not even sure, but I guess it would submit the form. But I guess most of you, in most cases, would just go with this, right? And, but, but this is behavior. Right? Why don't you, you use JavaScript for this? Well, because, because that's, that's how it is more natural to, to write this code. Or even a simpler example, what if you have a link and you want it to change its color when the user hovers it? Well, you could obviously write code like this, and it would probably even work. Again, I haven't tested it. But most probably you would go, I hope, with something like this. So some behaviors are more important than the others, and we think of them as of properties of the object, uh, of the objects, or as of some kind of um, attributes of the object, and not as a set of actions that we want to take uh, for them to, to be uh, working. So it makes sense for them to be uh, wrote, uh, written in, in terms of HTML or CSS. So. Uh, important behaviors deserve these declarative APIs, and your behavior, the behavior that your library implements, is obviously important because that's the whole reason the user links your library to their page. So why not just uh, give them a hand and make it easier to use? So I would call for using JavaScript for actual programming and uh, writing some boilerplate code that, that just makes things work. It is not programming, it's just a waste of time. OK, uh, from practical and ide ideological concerns to some personal ones. So some people would say he can't figure out JavaScript. So that's why he, he wants this, uh, you know, classes and, and stuff. 
Well, I can. I actually have uh, programming experience of about uh, 20 years. I have some experience with all of these technologies. And if you look at the history of programming, you know that it all evolves to use less and less code and to make this code more and more expressive and to have more and more meaning. And basically, all the things that can become declarative become declarative eventually. And the frameworks that we were uh, mentioning earlier, like Angular or React, even though, uh, though they are JavaScript things, they are declarative in some way uh, in that they use this state idea that tr translates to the dyna dynamic UIs. So instead of uh, dispatching a whole lot of events and stuff, you just write what something is, and then the frameworks uh, takes care of how to get there. So that's what you uh, want al almost always. Now, when I was discussing this topic with Madim Makeev, who invited me to, to talk here, he pointed me at a great article by Leah Vero at leah.vero.me. There's a long URL, I haven't put it, but if you go to her website, you will see that it's one of the top articles right now, uh, which is called HTML APIs, what they are and how to design a good one. So it's very, very close to uh, the, the, the title of my talk. And this is a really great article. I encourage you all to go and read it. But there is just one thing I wanted to comment on. She starts it with the text, I'm a strong believer in lowering the barrier. And it sort of sets the tone for the whole article as if it was some kind of charity for the dummies and we should you know, come down and help those people who can't figure out how the computers work. At least that's uh, a feeling that you could get uh, reading this article. And that's not how I feel about this. I just think it's not about lowering the barrier, it's about writing better code that makes more sense. So if you write less code and you express the ideas in your code the way you think, uh, it produces less errors, uh, and you will need less time to figure out how it works. And so you will attract uh, more users to, to, to the products that you make. So this is not for dummies, this is just better. And as a side effect, uh, maybe some beginners would, would have an uh, easier time learning uh, how to use your product. So also, I wanted to point out that this code, why, why do I even think that this is a bad code? Well, because it makes no, no sense. I mean, the first line, we just uh, said, we, we just call the constructor, uh, you, you mean, I mean, super complete is not even a verb, right? So it, it, it cannot be read un, unless you know the conventions of this uh, jQuery world. The ID doesn't have to be there. So the only reason you put this ID is because you want to link one part of the code with the other, which is uh, described in, in a different part of the document. Maybe you link your script in the beginning and then use this input in the middle, or you may link your script in the end. In any case, the very related things should be linked with some uh, very strange ways, and they are not uh, written in the same place in the document. That may lead to errors. And with this declarative approach, similar things look similar and are described in the same place, so this is much better. Okay, there are many more objections, but I don't have time for everything, so let's get to some uh, practice. So I would like to go through three of my products that, that I do for, for the web and describe the APIs I have there and why I have them the way they are. And we'll start with Likely, which are social sharing buttons maintained by Ivana Kulov. Um, so they look like this. If you are not using them, please do, they are the best. And for, for your page to get this, uh, these buttons, all you have to do is you put this uh, piece of HTML. And, well, it doesn't look really beautiful if you look at this, but you immediately get what's going on here. So you don't need documentation for many of the things that, may, uh, that you may want to do. For example, what if you don't want all these networks and, and you want just some of them? Well, you just remove the tags. What if you want to change the order of the buttons as they appear? Well, just reorder them the way you like. What if you don't want the captions for some of these buttons? What if you want just the icons of the networks? Well, just, just remove the captions. So you can put it in the docs, but when you do it like this, it's just obvious and self-documentary. Uh, 
So why do I use declarative APIs for likely? Well, because I think of this row of buttons as of a thing, uh, not an action, as of a noun, not a verb. So it makes much more sense to express this in terms of HTML uh, and to, to style this with CSS, of course, and not in terms of uh, JavaScript. Next one is Emerge. It's a page load coordinator. Uh, what's that? Well, if you just let some page load by itself, uh, it would look like this. This is my front page, by the way. So images would appear in random order, and the text would jump sometimes when the images uh, become ready. And this is not nice. And what you want, in, want instead is to do something like this. Um, no. So this is how it uh, really works on, on my website. So let me play it again. Oh, oh. OK, I also got this problem. All the buttons, even the left one, goes uh, forward. So again, this is the, the bad one, and, and this is the good one. You have a spinner, and then as the elements become available, they uh, fade in in this nice um, way. And so how do I do this? Uh, well, if you have a picture and you want it to appear only after it's been loaded, you just add a class equals emerge to it, and it's a, that's all you have to do. It just means that don't show this until it's ready and then fade it in. And what if your image has a caption and you don't want this caption to appear uh, either before the image is, is ready because it doesn't make any sense uh, without the image? Well, you just uh, wrap them both into a div with class equals emerge. And generally, if you wrap anything into a div with class equals emerge, it means that all the images and videos that are inside this div should load first, and then the div would fade in. And that, that's all the code you have to write to, to get this behavior. Sometimes you want more. For example, you want to show a spinner. If you have lots of stuff inside your div and it would take time for it to load, you want to show a spinner, well, you just try this data spin attribute and it gives you a spinner and there's a way to uh, adjust how it looks. Uh, you can also adjust the effect with which the elements appear. For example, here I'm not using just uh, a fade in effect, but a slide up one. And it's also done with these data attributes. And you can also set up the order in which the elements appear. For example, here we have two of these divs, and you want the second one to appear only after the first one has uh, appeared, even if all the images for the second one are ready. So you can just use data continue for that. And there are more things that you can set up. But let, let's look at this example. What do you have these two divs, which are both large enough that you want to show a spinner while they are loading, but you don't want this moment where Oh, where, uh, where two spinners appear at the same time. Uh, so how do you make a spinner appear only in, in the first one and then uh, appear at the second one when the first one is ready? Well, as you have probably guessed, there is no way to do it with uh, Emerge, and it's OK. So it doesn't have to be everything. There is still JavaScript available to your users. They can still implement the more advanced behaviors if they want that. So you can just start with covering more uh, general cases with your declarative uh, APIs. Now, <coughs> sorry, I would like to look at the data attributes that I use. You saw some of them. They're actually more because Emerge is rather uh, advanced thing. And if you look at them, they, are all, they all start with data, of course, but then they are very simple uh, dictionary words. And th this can, can cause conflicts. What if you're using some other uh, library that is also declarative and that also uses uh, these data attributes? For example, what if you want a photorama to fade in only after it has loaded all its images? You would probably write the code like this. You had these both classes. And for example, I have an attribute which is called data effect. And what if photorama has one also? Uh, how would this work? And if you think about this conflict, you would probably start changing your data attributes to something like this so uh, to, to make sure they are unique enough. And that's not what I would advise. Instead, I would recommend just nesting these divs. So uh, if you want the photorama to appear after it was ready, well, just wrap it into second div and just leave your attributes shorter and more easier uh, to read. So instead of trying to build something universal with your declarative APIs, Try to make them as clean and easy to read as possible. Because again, for advanced users, uh, uses, there is still JavaScript. No one uh, removes it. 
Okay, finally, I want to talk about Joel, which is an audio player. And someone has shared a link to an article with me, which shows lots of uh, audio players for the web, and they all look like this. And that's not what you want. There's another one. So Joel looks like this. It's really clean and, and simple, and you can be not embarrassed when, when you put it on your uh, web page. So how do you do it? Well, you just use a regular HTML link uh, to some MP3 file. And if you want it to be a working player, you just add class equals emerge. And that's all you have to do to get a working player. If you have several tracks on your page and you want them to play one by one, you can wrap this into a div with a class Joel playlist. And this will make all the tracks play uh, after the previous one uh, have finished. And now I want to show you a demo. Um, let me see how this works. So this is an, uh, a demo of yet unreleased version of Joel, so you cannot download it uh, for now. But it shows some new uh, concepts that we have. So this is a page of uh, one of my tracks. And uh, so this is a standard Joel. You can press play, and hopefully it will play. Yeah, you can hear that it's playing. You can scrub it. You can even press space to pause it. And have you heard that it was playing something? Yeah, OK, that, that's enough for understanding what I'm, talk what I'm talking about. Right, so this is a regular thing. But you may also notice that, so this is already working. You can download this Joel and use. But what's new? Well, I could also click this cover art. And it will also make the music play. And you may also notice that when the music is playing, there is this outline around the cover that appears somehow. And that's, that's how it works. And also, more interesting things happen if you go to some DJ mixes. So I like to publish the playlist of all the mixes that I do, uh, so to, to list all the songs that go into them. And I don't want this to be just a boring table of tracks. I want it to be interactive, so that, for example, if you want to listen to the Slip Archives 5, you can click it and it would jump to the particular point in time in this mix where this track is in full effect. So again, uh, you can see that not only the clicking on this table works, but also the current track gets highlighted. And I can even I can click the cover again to get this uh, uh, frame around the, the image. And I could also scrub the playlist, I mean, the, the, the mix, and you will see that this sort of cursor going through the playlist. So the question is, how is it done? Well, you may think that you would need JavaScript for this, but no, you wouldn't. Actually, it's very simple. So with a new version, which is, again, yet not released, we're adding a new kind of class, which is Joel Control. And Joel Control lets you nominate any element on the page uh, to be an element that controls your playback. So if you use a Joel Control with data type play pause, it will just play or pause the music. And that's what I do with the cover. And for the table, we also have this gel control with type seek, which can jump to a particular point in time. And again, that's, that's the whole code I have to write for this table of tracks to get this, um, this ability. But this explains only the one-way control. So this explains how the image controls the player, I mean, starts and stops the playback. And this explains how table rows control the playback in terms of uh, seeking to a particular time in this, in this track. But we actually have two-way control. As you've noticed, the player also controls the image, right? Because it gets this frame when the music is playing. And the player also controls the table because it gets this cursor that moves through the track list. So how do we do this? Well, if we were, I mean, we cannot just, oh, sorry. We cannot just have this uh, frame uh, be displayed for everything, right? Because in different designs, you may want uh, different appearances for the playback state. So with the JavaScript programming, we would probably implement some callback that would be called whenever the playback state changes and somehow implement that. Or maybe we could fire an event and then catch this event and do something when the playback state changes. But here we do something else. We do what we call abstract classes. And this is a term from programming, which uh, some of you may know. So it's a class which is defined but, but not implemented. In some languages, it's called interface or protocol. So you may know this. this. So we do the same with CSS. So with the new version of GL, we have classes which are called 
like this. So as you can see, they're like state classes. And these classes get assigned and unassigned to elements automatically by GL, so you don't have to do anything. So to get this frame around the image when the music is playing, all I have to do is to write this code. So I just say that the image, which is a GL control, when the music is playing, should get this outline. And this is literally all the code I have to do uh, to write to get this behavior. And as to this uh, table with the track list, uh, again, this is the code that makes it control the playback. But how do I highlight the current track? Well, I've actually cheated a little bit because in the, in the real page, instead of using data2 attribute, I'm using a data range attribute, which says that this part of HTML corresponds to this part of music. And obviously, we have a GL is within uh, abstract class, which gets assigned to this element of the table when the mix is playing within this range of time. And so all the code I have to write to get this cursor moving through the uh, play playlist is this. So within the mix playlist, every table cell, uh, which, is, which corresponds to, to, to this part of music, would get this background and this color. So it's really, really easy to build this uh, advanced behaviors. And this can be used to annotate podcasts, to write about classical music where you want to say that some part of text corresponds to a particular part of music and everything else just works uh, magically. And again, why do I do this in a declarative way? Why do, don't, don't I want to do it in, uh, in terms of JavaScript APIs of some sort? Well, because I think about these things as of markup. I don't think about this as of some events that have to fire or something. I just want to express the simple ideas that, that this uh, table uh, row corresponds to this range of music, and that's it. So how do I do this? Naturally, it should be done in markup, and everything else should be care, uh, taken care of by, uh, by the library. So to the conclusion, why do you want these declarative APIs? Well, first of all, it makes your code make sense. You, you get related code in one place. It's just better, and it produces let, less errors. And again, that's, this way you can attract more users, which is always a better thing. And the second thing, which I haven't mentioned yet, is that if you design these APIs well, your code uh, remains sensible even without JavaScript. For example, if JavaScript doesn't work somewhere like an email or in RSS context, your code would still make some sense. Instead of having a player, you would have a working link to an MP3 that could be downloaded or played in a browser. And uh, in, in case of Emerge, the page would just uh, display without this effect, but it would still work. Uh, how? How to do these uh, APIs? So, some of the advice that I could give, but again, you may come up with many other ideas, is that, first of all, think how, would you, how you would extend the standard HTML tags. Instead of uh, inventing new ones, maybe use what exists and then extend its um, behaviors. Use simple data attributes. Don't try to construct these long, long, long sentences into a word separated with, with dashes, which are hard to memorize and hard to read. Uh, go with something simpler. Use these abstract state classes for two-way control. This can be done, and this shouldn't require programming. And again, leave JavaScript for actual programming. And a couple of words about what's next in this regard. So. Obviously, I haven't talked about web components. I haven't used them myself yet, but uh, they can be used for, for this purpose also. It's just one of the ways you can do it. For example, for likely, I could have used some kind of special tag and then implement it somewhere. But this is not a universal way to do this. For example, for Jewel, I wouldn't want to use it. I don't, don't want my player to be this black box that is all in itself. I want to be able to nominate any part of the page uh, to be a control for this music as I do. And so I want to leave it an IMG tag and a table tag and then just add some special abilities to this tag. So, so this doesn't have to be web components, even though currently they are becoming more and more uh, available in the browsers. 
and as to emerge, it would probably make something like more sense if you could express it in CSS like this. Um, this is a fantasy, right? We don't have this in CSS. At least I don't know about this. But what if we had, had a loading pseudo class and could write something like this, that the element looks in one way while it is loading and then changes its appearance when it is ready? Well, maybe we will be able to do this in some time, but, but not today. But today we can probably use the custom properties for this. It's not as beautiful as the previous, uh, previous uh, way, but still maybe we could explore this. Again, this is not something I have looked uh, into, but this looks interesting to me. So the idea is not to use particular way that I've shown you, like classes and data attributes. Maybe there are more suitable ways to do this. The idea is that you express these things in a declarative way, and this thing is blinking because it wants me to stop. Anyway, so the, 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 the general question you could ask yourself, what if the behavior, what if the library that you are developing was part of HTML and CSS? What if it was not something that you built on top? How it would be structured? Would it be a tag? Would it be an attribute on, a, on an existing tag? Or would it be some kind of CSS properties? And then, uh, starting from there, you can build the declarative APIs for your thing, which works best. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. And I guess now <laughs> I would have to answer some questions. You have a choice. You can just run away. <laughs> uh, yeah. OK, I, I'll think about it. So you know how to, to turn this thing off, right? Yep. This is actually an like, uh, ancient thing. It's the first iPad. First generation. The only, oh, the iPad. It's, it's only the useful one. for timers. You should have put it in the museum of ancient oh, yeah. computers. <laughs> so, I have a number of questions, but I'll start with a comment regarding web, web components. You can actually wrap your existing content on a page into a take tag you create and use this content inside of script you pass to this web, web component. So you can have IMG and links, mm -hmm. and you can wrap it with a special tag Okay. And you will get uh, the content of this of this tag in your script, and you can use it. So it's it's not just a black box. You can okay. pass something inside easily. Well, what you described doesn't sound like a very natural way to describe these things. But I, again, I haven't looked at the web components. If they let you do this in a better way, then I'm all for it. So yeah, yeah, they're they're very very declarative by their nature. By their nature, so they they should yeah, fit. Yeah, the the examples I saw are all sort of these black boxes, and people think of them as of like yeah. these components that don't know anything about what's around, and that's not what I want. Yeah, they, so. they're usually empty in all demos, but you can actually put something in between those tags and get yeah, this I, content. I'm a designer, you know. I, well, I come don't on, you're not a designer, like, <laughs> designer with uh, some, like, Python background, right? No Python, no. <laughs> no Python. Like C-sharp? <laughs> uh, no C-sharp. <laughs> okay. That's right. right let's... Some C, some C. Um, a uh, question from Gleb. Uh, maybe it's better to use uh, data attributes instead of classes because uh, there could be no styling uh, uh, attached to this class. Uh, again, maybe. So if maybe. it makes more sense, then go ahead and use it. But for, for me, class is a natural way to, to describe what something is, what something's role is. And uh, even though we have a role attribute, as I've learned yesterday, actually. But I mean, I, I think it's a natural fit. But if for your product it makes more sense to use data attributes, then. Because yeah, that's the, fine. there's a built in browser API for, take, for getting the um, content of data attributes. So yeah, it's but at first, when you initialize the, the element, you have yeah. to select all the. All the DOM nodes, well, yeah. which have some class, and this is, I guess, a little bit easier to do. No, or it's, now it's, it's, it's the, same. the same level of complexity, but yeah, there, okay. th there are some built-in uh, uh, APIs. Why? Right. Uh, Anton is asking. Uh, I, have, I have a feeling that such approach would fail on complex APIs. Should I use it for everything? I guess we should look at what ex exactly you are doing, and maybe I can come up with some ideas, but th this is not a rule. This is just an approach that, that you can explore. And if you have really complex library that gets lots of stuff, maybe you can expose just part of that functionality, the most basic, uh, in this declarative way, and then leave all the rest for, for the JavaScript APIs, and that's fine. 
Okay, um, something not quite related to your talk, but more closer to you. How do you use code in your work as designer? Uh, at what step do you prototype in graphic editors or you prototype in code somehow? Um, I actually only use code for, for, for the actual projects I build, like these libraries or my website or okay. some, some products I do. So things that Anton showed in the beginning today, it's like very far from, from what I do. I use Photoshop, I don't even use Sketch, so. Okay, uh, old, but fashioned. I don't, huh? old fashioned, old fashioned Yeah, so I don't know these things, but they make sense. I just, I can ask someone to do it and so I don't care. <laughs> okay, so because like we, we, were, we were trying to meet somewhere in between, like between code and design, mm -hmm. but, your, but, but in your case, it's just a tool for publishing uh, your designs on the web, right? Uh, I think so. Okay. Yeah, but I enjoy it. So, for example, writing my blogging engine is takes a lot of time, and it's it's nice. Yeah, when things work. But it's not it's not a typical uh, thing for designers, like typical graphic designers, to 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 know code. So, uh, do you know, do you have an idea or like opinion uh, why why is it so? Why graphic designers, especially in Russia, I think uh, they have uh, less code knowledge or typical uh, skills like that than uh, uh, designers from from Europe or US or somewhere else? I, like, is it I, education? I uh, have no idea, actually. I think there is some, the separation, you're, you're saying uh, like designer, a programmer, a developer, as if they were some different things, but we build stuff and we use all the tools that are available for us. And sometimes we need to, I don't know, make a sound for our app. And so we can, if we know some tools to make sounds, we can go okay. and use them. Some people know how to do 3D stuff, I have no idea. And if they know that, they can incorporate some 3D in their uh, uh, web pages or applications. Just don't. If you if you're a designer and you and you don't code, it may be just because you think it's a separate uh, thing. But just go ahead and start learning it. And that's fine. But how did you start? Uh, have you started with coding or design or like both? Now, I have actually been working for three years or something as a designer before I started calling myself one. Okay. So I started uh, in programming definitely. But what was the what was the reason you, you, you tried to code something for the first time? Because it feels like magic. I mean, you, <laughs> you, you do something and it works. It's something what uh, Eva was talking about. It's really a pleasant experience. I mean, if you, need, if you, are, if you have to build a rocket and watch it uh, fly in, in the sky, this is a really complicated and expensive thing to do. And most of the people who want to do this stuff cannot because it's just out of their reach. But for us, it's, we're just so lucky that whenever we have an idea, we can just get a computer which, which costs nothing compared to rockets and just make it work. So, I mean, what could stop us? Just, just do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you all. So um, I, use, I use a number of applications you designed, some, some of your libraries. So looking forward to something new. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Okay.